We are this morning continuing our series entitled Geared Up for Life, uh, learning about our faith through the book of Ephesians, learning how to live out our faith uh, through the book of Ephesians. And, and this morning's message, I'm entitling it simply truth, not simply, but truth. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And and, and what I want you to know about this series so far is uh, that we've been in is, is the book of Ephesians is divided into two halves. I think you're going to remember this uh, even a year from now because I've said this every week. Uh, the first half, chapters 1 through 3, are a theological foundation, kind of like this is what you need to believe so that you can uh, so that you can live out your faith. This is the, the foundation for your faith. And we all know how important foundations are. We want to build our foundation on Christ. And uh, the second half uh, begins to transition around chapter 4 and transitions into the practical uh, reality of this is actually what you do to live out your faith. And so we're getting into the action part of the book of Ephesians this morning in our series Geared Up for Life. Again, this morning I'm calling it The Truth, and we're reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 uh, through chapter 5, verse 2. It's about uh, 7 or 8, 9 verses Beginning with verse 25. Therefore, after you have gotten rid of lying, each of you must tell the truth to your neighbor, because we are parts of each other in the same body. Be angry without sinning. Don't let the sun set on your anger, and don't provide an opportunity for the devil. Thieves should no longer steal. Instead, they should go back to work, or they should go to work, using their hands to do good so that they will have something to share with whoever is in need. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what is helpful. Boy, that's a hard part, isn't it? Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits. Don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. Put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander along with every other evil. Be kind, compassionate, forgiving to each other in the same way that God forgave you in Christ. Therefore, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. He was a sacrificial offering that smells sweet to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful for the Apostle Paul and for his faithfulness to you and for the transformation that you performed in his life, turning him from one of your uh, most horrible persecutors to one of the leaders and, a, and defenders of, of the faith. God, we're so thankful for, for Paul's life and for his writings and uh, for his messages that he gave, and, and especially this morning for the the letter he wrote to the book of Ephesians and uh, the letter that we know also went around to, to all parts of, of the Middle Eastern world that shared your good news, that, that shared that we are called to be a people uh, who are one body and one body who lives in truth. So God, help us this morning to be able to, 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 to understand what you are, are saying to us through this book. Help us to receive it at the very place of our need this morning. And in all things, God, may you be glorified. So now the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts went together to be pleasing in your sight. Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. There's this uh, tendency that we have, and, and we see it, we, we learn about it. Uh, I learned about it a lot from, from reading scripture, but I've also witnessed it in my own life quite a bit. The, the tendency, I, I want to call it the, the tendency to want to go back to Egypt, the, to no matter how good life uh, is or, or how many uh, you know great things or how much transformation and, and kind of like those spiritual high moments that I've had and, and feeling drawn close to Christ, I, I still find myself oftentimes in life where, where I kind of want to turn around and I want to go back and, and, and I kind of want to go back and, and seek the, 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 the things that, that were easy or, or that were comfortable. And, and sometimes, and we're going to learn about this as we talk today and read through the book of Ephesians, but you know, sometimes I want to get my way. Sometimes I, I, I'm angry and I'm, and I'm mad at somebody and I want to get revenge on them. And, 
And you know, sometimes that's the kind of this old way of me. I, I want to go back to Egypt. Uh, we see this all throughout Scripture. I mean, we, we see the people of Israel, they were, they were slaves. And, and, and I think especially in our own modern context, we think how horrible like it is to be a slave, like one of the worst things that you could possibly imagine, one of the kind of the worst institutions to ever happen, even here in our own country. The idea of slavery is just so grotesque. And, and so here are the people of Israel who were slaves and held in bondage in, in Egypt, and, and they got free from that. And, and, as, and, and then all they did, wanted to do was they wanted to go back. They wanted to go back to, to because at least it was like they knew that that they knew that devil that that was back in Egypt. But now they they they, they found on the other side, and sometimes we forget too on the on the other side of, of, of this life in Christ is is, is oftentimes uh, there's a desert. Sometimes there's dry places that we find. There's there's hard times. There's there's moments where we have to sacrifice, and there's times where where it's not about us and it's about somebody else. It's not about us. It's about our church community. It's about the body. And, and so there's moments where even as we're following Jesus, the most wonderful thing in the whole world to give your life to Jesus and to be saved. And if you've experienced that radical transformation of knowing what it was like to live in the dark to now live in the light, and then there's those times where you just want to go back to the way things used to be because there was something about it that was easier. I mean, sometimes it seems over and over again we read through Scripture and again we experience in our own life that, that we would rather experience bondage than the freedom that's allowed to us in Christ. Paul knew this about the, the human spirit. Paul knew this about the people of Ephesus. He knew this about all the churches that would have received this letter, that they had this inner need to want to go back to Egypt. And, and so he writes, and he began writing in chapter 4, verse 15, that we read some of that last week. He's telling them, instead of being the way that you used to be, now you have to speak truth in love. And he says, let's grow in every way into Christ. I mean, every way that you can possibly imagine, every single corner of your life, every single you know dark corner of your life, some of it that you think you have hidden, God knows it, God sees it, and he wants to grow that in every way into Christ. He wants to grow that in Christ. He wants to, and then he begins, Paul says in verse 17, but you shouldn't live like the Gentiles anymore. He knew that the people who were the Gentiles who had once been a people who had no hope, they had once been a people who were without God. They were once a people who didn't know salvation, that there wasn't really a road to salvation for them, that they were the Gentiles that now come into this marvelous light, and yet they too wanted to go back to being Gentiles. They wanted to go back to their former ways. And, and so Paul says, but that's not what you should do. That shouldn't be how you live your life. You don't live like Gentiles anymore. Gentiles were people, he says, that they, they, they spend their days thinking about pointless things. They spend their days arguing with people about pointless arguments. That was the way the Gentiles were. But you are now in Christ, and because you are in Christ, you are about someone, and you are for something that is much greater than just yourself. No one single person is, is by themselves fully the church, and, and so we have to join together to be all that we are called to be, and we want to be for something greater because we stand for someone greater. In fact, we stand for the greatest name that is above all names. In verse 20, he reminds them again that this way that you are trying to live, that, that, that tendency inside of you to want to go back to Egypt and to want to revert back to living in bondage again, that, that inside of you is not something that you learned from Christ. But now, Paul writes, since you've really listened to the truth in Jesus, change that former way of living. Go ahead and accept the fact. Go ahead right now and, and, and decide that no matter how hard it is on the other side of that bondage and freedom away from Egypt, that you're not going to go back. You're never going to go back to Egypt again. You're never going to go back to that old way of living again because you've learned the truth from Jesus. Change the former way of life that was a part of the person that you once were because that's not who you are anymore. Renew the thinking in your mind by the Spirit, Paul writes, and clothe yourself in the new person created according to God's image in justice and in true holiness. And all of that's from what we read last week. Paul continues this week in his writing and he says, therefore, and the therefore is predicated on all those things that Paul had said last week. And, and now he says, therefore, after you have gotten rid of lying, 
He says the old you, the old way of living was a lie. The whole way of you lived your life, in fact, was a lie. But now that you have become a new person, you're going to put away that lying. You're going to put away that kind of life that led to lies, and you're not going to lie anymore. Now that you've gotten rid of the lying and the old way, each of you must tell the truth to your neighbor. This question this week, and, and, and I don't know if we're going to get it answered today, but I would invite you to think about that question. What does it mean to tell the truth? Specifically, what does it mean to tell the truth to your neighbor? Uh, one of the thoughts that I, I had about this and something that, that I've wondered about, I, I used to have a neighbor that I thought that they were being helpful, and, and so that they would uh, come along and, and they would cut my grass for me, like, you know, about five foot over onto my property, which isn't that really nice when you want somebody to cut your grass for you, but they would lower their lawnmower all the way down as far as they could do it, because that's how they cut their grass, and so the sun comes out, we all know what happens. Our, our lawn, folks, it just burns the, gra the grass to a crisp. And, and so I'd always think, do I, is loving my neighbor and telling the truth of my neighbor, telling them, please stop cutting my grass that shorter, you know, raise it up high. Like what's, most, what's the most important, what's the highest value here? I don't know if that's the kind of truth telling that Jesus is wanting us to do uh, for our neighbors. He says, tell the truth to your neighbor. What I do find interesting, and I believe it's worth pointing out, is in this phrase is that when he says tell the truth, we must tell the truth to our neighbor. We see that Paul is always, and throughout this entire letter so far, he's been trying to, to take the individual, uh, the, 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 the way that we tend to want to focus on ourselves individually. Paul continually turns it back and says, and it's not about you as a person individually, it's about the whole body. If one part of the body is hurt, if one part of the body is broken, if, if one part of the body, if, if you think that it's less important, it's certainly not because the whole body needs to function together as one whole. The body, we need the body. And so he says, you need to tell the truth to your neighbor. You need to tell your truth in the body of Christ. And, and so one thing I believe that he's certainly sharing with us here is that the body of Christ, the community that called the church, must reflect truth because Jesus is the truth. So we should be truth seekers. We should be truth reflectors because we are all parts of each other. We are all part of the same body in Christ. You may remember Pontius Pilate is, the, is where we actually get the question, what is truth? Jesus had just said to Pontius, I come into the world to testify to the truth. And Pontius Pilate replies to him, what is truth? Now, you see, Pontius Pilate would have had a lot of problems with Jesus if that day that he stood before, that Jesus stood before Pilate, if, 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 if Jesus would have, would have said that my kingdom is of this world. In fact, Pontius Pilate, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're about to see my people come sweeping in, and they're going to drive you out first, and then they're going to take the Roman Empire out first, and the people of Israel are going to kill all the Romans or drive all the Romans out of the land. If he would have said anything like that or hinted to anything like that, Pontius Pilate would have had a real problem with him. Instead, Jesus says, this kingdom that I am for is not of this world. My kingdom is, is elsewhere. And then he goes on to say, I have come into this world to testify to the truth. And Pontius Pilate says to him, what is truth? Jesus says, I am the truth. Jesus told him and he's told us elsewhere that I am the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. So maybe by this uh, question or maybe by this phrase, Jesus means that wherever you find truth, Jesus is there. I don't quite know if that does it justice or not. Wherever you find Jesus, the truth is there. You know, kind of along the way we say if, if something is good, then it must be of God. All things good are of God. I'm not sure if that's what it means. I mean, maybe Jesus is saying, and I think this phrase would really preach well, where, whatever else in the world may be true, there may be lots of things that are true in the world, but Jesus is the truth. I don't know if that's what he means either. But I do believe that he means something along this line. I think we can certainly, taking scripture as a whole and all the things Jesus said about himself and, and all these phrases we're reading here, what Paul is saying about the truth, that Jesus is saying to us that, that we should be people of the truth. That the people who call ourselves by the name of Christ should, should be truth seekers should be truth tellers. We, we should, and what that looks like, I believe it looks like we speak like Jesus, we act like Jesus, and we share the same values of Jesus. We speak like Jesus, we act like Jesus, we share the values of Jesus. And so I want to ask you this morning that in your friend groups, in your Sunday school class, do you speak like Jesus? Do you share the values of Jesus? Are your actions that of like Jesus? Are you bringing conversations back to Jesus? I used to lead a, a Bible study 
it's one, for me, it's been one of the greatest things I've ever done in ministry. And it, the, the conversations focused on where real life and faith intersected. And, and we had a really different like, group of people that came. And, I, and, and there were people who came to that group who said they would never come to church. One guy was adamant. Uh, he, he came to know our church and, and met me through a Narcotics Anonymous group that met in our basement. And, uh, and, and he said, I will never, ever come to church is where he, said, is where he started. And then he started coming to my group and he said, I'll never, ever, ever come to your worship service. He did come once. But he's like, but he came to he came to that Thursday night Bible study every single week, and he was one of the most vocal and shared the most of anybody there uh, that he would come and share in the group. And and what I what I loved about the group was we would start in so many different places. You know, we would start the conversation would start in some of the wildest places. But I, I served in my myself the way I saw myself was just the the bumper lanes in the bowling alley. I was always going to take, no matter where they threw that ball, I was going to take it and try to guide it back to Jesus. I was going to say, what does Jesus teach us, have to teach us about that? What, do you, what, what, is, your, what is your reflection on, on Christ? Where is Christ in this situation? And so we have to ask ourselves, are, are we sharing like Jesus? Are we speaking like Jesus? Are we acting like Jesus? And so this morning, I want you to take an introspective look at yourself. If you're being really, really honest, nobody else knows what you decide in your mind this morning. But I also know one of the first things that you're going to want to do when I ask this question is you're going to want to fix your spouse. Don't do that. Don't fix your spouse in your mind. Don't fix your kids in your mind. Just leave them out of it. It's not about them this morning. It's only about you. Okay, so we're going to ask this question. When you're honest with yourselves, do you think the conversations that you've had over this past year reflect the values of Jesus? With the conversations that you have either led, the conversations that you have started, or even in the way that you have participated in conversations this past year, have they reflected the values of Jesus? Have they pointed people to Jesus? Would people say that because they have known you over this last year, that they have drawn closer to Christ? That they are better off because they had a conversation with you? Because they had a social media interaction with you? Are they better off? because of some interaction they've had with you? If the answer for you is no, and nobody else knows, that's the good thing about being able to be completely like honest and self-reflective. If the answer for you in that situation is no, what are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna change? How are you gonna approach conversations in the future? How are you gonna approach your social media interactions in the future? How are you gonna approach your friends and your family going forward from this day forward? How are you going to be a truth teller? A truth teller. How are you going to be a person that reflects the values and the, the speech and the actions of Jesus so that other people would come to know Christ through your, through your life? The second point I want us to raise up, besides the fact that we need to be truth tellers, is, is we want to make sure that we're not a people. I don't, I don't believe as a people as following Jesus, I don't think we have any reason whatsoever to even give the devil his due. I don't think we owe the devil anything, and I don't think he deserves anything from us. And so don't even give the devil any time of your, of your or effort in your day. It doesn't mean that he doesn't exist, but it means that you're not going to give him any kind of congratulatory, because that's what he sees. Anytime you're sitting there saying, well, the devil made me do that, or the devil calls that to happen, the devil's going, that's right, it's me. Look at me, look at me, because he's filled with pride, and he's filled with all his stuff that he's doing. That's the, We don't even want to give the devil his due. Paul writes that we can be angry without sinning, and don't let the sun set on your anger. And he says, don't provide an opportunity for the devil. Don't even give the devil his due. Paul says quite a bit right there in that, in that passage, and it's just a couple of uh, two verses. But what we need to know here is anger itself is not sinful, but it can quickly lead to sin. And, and what Paul is saying, and I believe this is good as somebody who studied a little bit of like a marriage counseling. Uh, what Paul is saying, and the, the way that I was raised in my family, my mom and dad, uh, they had this belief that you don't let the sun set on your anger. Now, I can see it from both sides. I, I think sometimes it's good to get away from each other. There, there are couples, uh, and maybe it, could even, it doesn't have to be a marital relationship. It could be friends. It could be coworkers. There might be times where you need a little bit of separation. But I really like the ideal that Paul sets before us here, and, and that is we're not going to go to bed at each other's throats. We're not going to go to bed and let the little argument that we had tonight fester in the you know like overnight and grow into something big the next day we're not going to let the sun set on our angle anger and the reason we're not going to let the sun set on our anger is because we're not going to let the devil stick his foot in the door 
Because that's exactly what the devil's looking for. It's just that opportunity between you and somebody else. The devil's looking for his chance between somebody here in this church, for two people in this church. Maybe he can get his foot in between the two of you, and he can put you at your throats, and he can cause division in the church. And if the devil can do that, and he can get his foot in, and he can get some glory from it, he's going to be celebrating with all of his dominions and all the demons. They'll be so grateful for the work they did to divide some people in the church, to divide a marriage, to divide some people from their children don't give the devil his due don't give him an opportunity to get his foot in your life don't give him the opportunity to get his foot in your relationships instead you can be angry about something you can even argue with somebody about something but you need to do it without sinning and so what does that look like now now we know i think pretty easily that that sinning if you result to physical violence if you result to to, to verbal abuse I, I think we'd all agree, I hope you all agree, that we're, we're now being angry and we're sinning. But how can you be anger, angry without sinning? How do we know we crossed the line? And there's a few ways this morning. I'm going to give you four. There might be more, but I'm going to give you four ways that we can, we can tell if we become angry and, be, and also sinful. Angry and sinning. What does that look like? Uh, the first it says is that we, we stir up trouble or intentionally offend others. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22, it says, Angry people stir up conflict, and hotheads cause much offense. Angry people stir up conflict, and hotheads cause much offense. If you instigate trouble, if you're the kind of person that, and, and like whatever reason you've gotten angry at somebody, or maybe you just like to see people angry, you know, you might call Bob and tell Bob what Sam had just said about, about Bob and, and hoping that there's going to be a fight started. You're stirring things up. You're stirring up conflict. If you're stirring up conflict, if you're a hothead that's causing offense, if you know someone's sensitive about something, and so you use that as something to, to really go after them, you're being angry and you're sinning. You're not being angry without sinning. You stir up trouble or intentionally offend others. The next thing might be bitterness. Bitterness is what we're talking about when, when you go to bed and you have a little argument with your spouse or you have an argument with a friend and, and then somewhere in the middle of the night, you know, you start to hear that whisper like, can you believe what they said about you? Do you know that she's always thought that you were lazy? She's always thought that you were, that you were this or you always thought that you were that. And you wake up the next day and you're more angry than you ever thought you was going to be because you let the devil get the foothold in. You become bitter. Psalm 30 verse 5 says that God's anger is but for a moment. And in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26, it warns us against staying angry overnight, what we just read in our text. Extended, extended anger usually leads and it festers into bitterness. And God instructs us to put aside all bitterness and losing your temper and anger and shouting and slander along with every form of evil. Not only uh, do we have bitterness and stirring up trouble, but the third thing would be isolation. And, and this is one of the red flags for me. This is how I know that, that my anger is festering over into, into a place of sinfulness is, is when I begin to isolate myself uh, from the people that I'm mad at, that I begin to kind of like separate. And what happens when we separate? A lot of times we, again, there are times where you need cool off periods. But beyond the cool off period, a lot of times the separation begins to be, uh, it begins to grow like a, a big uh, wedge between you. And, and now you've not come together. You've not talked in two days and three days and five days. The next thing you know, you haven't talked to somebody in six months. You haven't talked to your family in a year because you let something, this little bitty argument that started over Thanksgiving dinner, it's now become this huge, huge problem. Isolation, nursing anger leads people to avoid each other and eventually will cut off their relationship altogether. In Proverbs 18, verse 1, it warns people, it warns that unfriendly people look out for themselves. They bicker with sensible people. Eventually, we become, uh, we want to be right. And we're so, so concerned with being right and so concerned with winning that nothing else matters and we fail to sh show the love of God. Second Timothy tells us God's slave shouldn't be argumentative. Do you know that we're God's slave in that sentence? Christians, followers of Jesus, shouldn't be argumentative, but should be kind toward all people, able to teach, patient, and should correct opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will change their mind and give them the knowledge of truth. Whose job is it to change lives? Whose job is it to change minds? It's God's. It's not, it's not our work. And four is my most, at least in my past, has been my most difficult one. 
We know that we have become angry and being led into, the, we're crossing the line to sinfulness when we start to want to retaliate. But boy, don't we want to retaliate sometimes? I was in a Bible study in 2012 when I had this deep, deep insight into myself. If you would have asked me the moment before that Bible study we had that night, I would have told you that I'm the most graceful, forgiven person you're ever going to meet on two feet. I, I really believed that about myself at the time. And we were writing the Bible study, and I don't know, the person leading it asked the question in the right way. And all of a sudden, these flood of memories of times came back. Uh, where I was unforgiving and I had held grudges. You know, I had a kid trip me in kindergarten that I made sure like 10 or 12 years later, I got him back for it. And the only reason that I got him back for it was because of what he did when I was five years old running through the halls in kindergarten. And I knew exactly the moment that I saw him walking up, I said, today's his day. That ended with my brother going, William, have you lost your mind? Romans 12 says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. Remember, this is because the angry person doesn't produce God's righteousness in James 1.20. It's not for us to retaliate. It's not for us to get revenge. We have to leave that to God. When you find yourself beginning to cross that line, Ephesians 4.27 tells us that we don't want to let the devil have his due. We don't want the devil to get his foothold. We don't want the devil to have an opportunity to do anything destructive in our lives that would cause us to then be destructive in someone else's. And so when you feel yourself coming up to that line, or maybe you've already crossed that line, the first thing you need to do is confess it. You probably have to confess it like I did back in 2012. you got to have this moment of, of self-realization where you go, you know what, I really have a problem with this. I hold grudges against people. That can be really hard to admit. It was really hard for me to admit. I hold grudges. I still struggle to hold grudges. I mean, if you do something, if you trip me on the way out of church, I'm probably going to be mad at you for a while. I might laugh today, actually, but that I might be upset about it. It might hurt my feelings. You know, I don't know, but you got to confess it to yourself. I think it's good to confess to the other person. Now, not all the time is it good to tell everybody that you were offended by. Well, sometimes that causes more problems than good. But if it's something that you really can't overcome, then you might need to want to confess that to them. But you also want to confess those feelings to God. You want to also pray for that person. You can't pray for you can't pray for somebody on a regular basis and continue to dislike them. And so I can urge you to pray for them and then ask the Lord's guidance in the situation if you feel yourself beginning to cross that line. If you feel yourself beginning to be angry and sinful, it's possible to be angry and sin not, the Bible tells us, but we want to be make really sure that we don't cross that line. In verse, uh, as Paul continues in verse 28, he tells us to do good and speak what is helpful. This may be the most complicated part of the passage uh, because of how hard it is to only speak when it's helpful. He, he starts with verse 28. He actually says something that I believe we all like. He says, thieves should no longer steal. And, I, and we could really insert anything. He chose the word thieves here. and I believe he chose the word thieves for the, for the contrast of a thief could actually turn into a person that is helpful to society. A thief could actually become somebody, instead of taking from someone else, they're giving to other people. And that's where Paul actually takes it. But we really, for this first part of the passage, could, could insert our own sins and our own habits and our own hangups where it says thieves, we can insert whatever it is, whatever our hurts, habits, hangups are, where it says thieves, we can insert it right there and it can say, don't do that anymore because that's the old you and now you're a part of the new creation. That's the point Paul's over and over trying to get through to us is that we have been made new in Christ. But what he uses the word thieves again is because he wants them to know that that if even a thief can turn around and do good, even a thief can turn around and be someone who instead of taking from the world, gives back to his community. There's that community application of the wholeness of the body of Christ and the helping one another with inside the body that Paul likes to focus on. In verse 29, it says, don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. The word uh, that's used here for uh, unwholesome or foul language means careless language, where you say something without even, you're not thinking about what you're saying, you're not thinking through, you know, the, the ramifications of the words that you're using. Only say what is helpful and used for building up the body. 
These unwholesome words could be gossip. It could be slander. It could be, uh, it's not limited to just those things, but anything that injures another person, anything that sparks dissension could be what Paul's talking about here. We are new creations. Anybody have trouble only saying what is helpful for the building up of the body of Christ? It's hard work. But it's what we're called to be as new creations. As a people who speak blessings and not curses. Paul says this was the old you. The old you was marked in verse 31 by bitterness, by losing your temper, by anger, by shouting, by slander, along with every other evil. That was the old you. But you've been made new. You've been made new through Christ, and it's time to begin living that way. It's time for Christians to act like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, and to have the values of Jesus, to live for someone and live for something greater than ourselves individually, something bigger than ourselves, and and put on these new traits to be kind and compassionate and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore imitate God like dearly loved children. Again, like we learned in the first couple of weeks, that could be translated in our favorite Southern dialect. It actually could be translated, all y'all be imitators. All y'all be imitators of God because you are God's dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. He was a sacrificial offering that smelled sweet, sweet to God. Let's pray. God, we we thank you that through you we have the opportunity, the, the chance to be made into new people. God, make us new. Create in us a clean heart. Help us to live a life of truth and to live a life of standing up for things that matter that we would be angry and sin not, that we would not let the devil have a foothold into our life, that we would speak only what is helpful and for the building up of the body. God, we can't do it alone. We can't do it on our own strength, but we can do it with your help. And so we give to you this time here today, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.